What's up guys, my name is Jake and welcome to Abandoned, episode 60. When I was driving down to New Orleans to shoot my feature documentary, I stopped for a night in Memphis, Tennessee. We had a nice time, but just down the road from our hotel was probably the most insane looking retail store I have ever seen. That being the Bass Pro Shops at the Pyramid. So, of course, I had to check it out before we left town, and the entire time I was there, I just couldn't understand how this thing got built. Because, of course, Bass Pro Shop didn't build it. So join me today as I figure out how this unbelievable monument became a reality, and the ultimate downfall of a very ambitious project. This is the Great American Pyramid, otherwise known as the Memphis Pyramid. It all began in the mid-1950s when a local artist envisioned a trio of massive steel pyramids alongside the Mississippi River. This was merely an ambitious dream at that point, but it was so strange and so captivating that the idea would be resurrected over 30 years later with his son, John Brent Hart. John saw an opportunity in the growing tourism industry in the home of blues. Memphis, Tennessee, at least to John, was the perfect place to bring his father's weird idea back to life. So, by 1986, the project was officially announced. It was dubbed the Great American Pyramid, and its main function was to serve as a 20,000-seat basketball arena. But there was so much more to it. In early concepts of the project, this proposed 330-foot-high aluminum structure would be painted gold and, according to the concept art, would be located just south of the downtown core. Even at this early stage, over $150,000 had been invested for a feasibility study as the project entered the approval stages of city planning. Many were enthusiastic though, as the project was thought to have been a great location for sporting events, and with its proposed rooftop Hall of Fame museum, it could attract hundreds of thousands of tourists. Total costs were estimated at around $60 million, the vast majority of that being taxpayer money, around $50 million worth of city funds. Another $10 million of private investment was also secured. In 1989, the Daily News Journal published an article quoting Sidney Schlenker, the lead construction manager. He said, quote, I think it is the next great building that's been built since the Houston Astrodome. What is being built here is a monument. It's like the Statue of Liberty and the Eiffel Tower. Disney and MGM just built a park themed to movies and television. This one will be themed to music and will be a similar operation. So, obviously, optimism was pretty high among the people dealing with the project. 5,000 years ago, the world trembled before the might of Cheops' pyramid. Soon, there will be another occasion for awe. Soon, mankind will be dazzled by a new wonder of the world. From the banks of the Mississippi, across the oceans and continents, and up to the heavens, a vibrant message will ring out. Feel the power of the Great American Pyramid. And with that, everything was ready to go, and construction began in September of 1989. After a very theatrical, groundbreaking ceremony, construction continued into the new decade and was completed in November of 1991. The owners saw this as a pretty strong start, despite the accidental flooding in the basement. The stadium portion seemed to have been working just fine. But then again, that's all that was built. By opening day, there was over 150,000 square feet of undeveloped space within the Memphis Pyramid. This was for the promised music museum, Hard Rock Cafe, and Observation Deck. And those were just within the structure itself, as a music theme park of sorts was planned for the adjacent Mud Island. Sidney Schlenker claimed another $50 million in what was apparently private capital would have to go into the construction project to finish these important projects. However, in June, before the grand opening, he was fired and his management company filed for bankruptcy as they were in $16 million worth of debt. Despite this, the owners began looking for tenants to fill the vacant space as progress was made getting the stadium filled regularly. Over the next decade, the venue was fairly successful, hosting 12 seasons of basketball, the first and second rounds of the NCAA, and was home to the University of Memphis's Tigers. 
It was the area's main stadium and saw notable players like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. But also a number of concerts were held at the Pyramid with performances from huge artists like Billy Joel, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam, Bob Dylan, and many, many more. The Memphis Pyramid also played host to the iconic fight between Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson, an event that brought famous people from all over the world to Memphis and the very unique venue it took place in arguably making that event the most iconic in Memphis's history. Despite all of this notoriety though, there were looming issues with the stadium. While many praised the unique architecture that came along with the venue, that unorthodox design for a stadium proved to be a bit of a challenge. Because of the enormous space above the stage and seats below, the acoustics were an extra annoyance for crews. For players in the NBA, the intimidating scale of the wide open space above gave the pyramid the nickname the Tomb of Doom. Additionally, locals in the area were rather underwhelmed with the end product. Remember the great American pyramid that was being touted as the next wonder of the world? A Disney-level attraction that would become the new iconic symbol for the Midwest? Well, general enthusiasm on the Master Project quickly fell apart as people began realizing that the taxpayer money helped fund the construction of a massive steel pyramid in the middle of Memphis, Tennessee. The tourism aspect of the pyramid never got off the ground and essentially sat vacant and abandoned through this whole time. By the early 2000s, the city of Memphis was looking to lure a professional NBA team back to their city and more specifically into the pyramid as their home stadium. The Grizzlies were the main focus and the city secured a three-year contract with them while another $250 million arena was being built a mile south of the pyramid. Around $7 million was spent on updating the decade-old event space, getting it ready for a major NBA team to play in. The excitement for this, however, soon plummeted, as once the team started playing there, the facility began losing money. By 2002, it was reported that the Memphis Pyramid lost around $200,000, mainly because in the agreement with the city, the Grizzlies kept all the ticket sales. So just on rent alone from the team, it wasn't enough to outweigh the losses, especially after a notable decrease of events were held within the building. By September, the new stadium opened as the FedEx Forum, and the Grizzlies moved to it as planned. This now meant the Memphis Pyramid was without any regular tenants and had been losing money at an alarming rate. By now, the city had been debating on whether or not they should just close it down entirely. City council members argued the facility would cost them over $1.6 million if it were to stay open. Others suggested a committee should look into alternative uses for the space, and ultimately the vote came down to a tie. This topic was very contentious, but ultimately the city voted to keep it open. However, with a larger, modern stadium literally a few blocks down, a non-compete clause meant that the amount of events held at the pyramid would be limited. By the mid-2000s, the Memphis Pyramid was just used a few times out of the year, eventually hosting its final event on February 3rd, 2007 with Bob Seger. This was the official send-off. Immediately after, the building was shuttered and abandoned indefinitely. The interior was maintained as best as it could be as the city began seeking out other development opportunities, one of which was from a rather odd potential buyer. That being Bass Pro Shops, an outdoor retail chain that is best known for their ultra-themed superstores. They officially unveiled their intentions to lease out the property and turn it into a mega retail store mixed with other entertainment activities. They stated that over $75 million would be invested to make their crazy idea a reality. But talks were still ongoing with the city on the specifics of the deal. Progress was slow, and during this, the Memphis Pyramid continued to sit disused and abandoned. The exterior of the weathered structure appeared unmaintained with crumbling concrete and foliage breaking through the cement entranceways. Clearly the building was in a limbo state, yet still a pretty eye-catching landmark to anyone who isn't used to a massive, abandoned steel pyramid in the middle of their city. 
As if this whole saga wasn't strange enough, I guess the immense oddity of the whole vacant building started stirring up conspiracies. Mainly, and I swear I'm not making this up, with Alex Jones claiming the building was cursed with bad luck from the developers who were in a cult and put a crystal skull on the top of the pyramid. Apparently it represents the New World Order and the Illuminati's subliminal messaging in the form of the Memphis Pyramid. Now obviously everything he claimed here is untrue, apart from the skull. Yes, so apparently in 1991, just after it opened, a crystal skull was found welded at the very top, allegedly put there by Hard Rock Cafe's CEO for good luck I guess? Yeah, it's a bit weird and sort of makes you think if all Hard Rock cafes around the world have skulls welded behind their walls. Well, regardless, that weird fact ended up attracting a lot of other weird stuff with other wacky people thinking the building is some sort of satanic devil's palace. They're literally talking nonsense, but yeah, it probably has something to do with religion. Anyways, on June 30th, 2010, Bass Pro Shops announced they had reached a deal with the city with another $30 million worth of taxpayer money invested into the new project. Over the course of the next two years, the pyramid was gutted, creating a concrete shell of the former 20,000-seat stadium. The crumbling exterior walkways and entranceways were also torn down during this time. Construction then began on the elaborately themed Bass Pro Shop interior, turning the inside of the former stadium into a wilderness adventure store. On April 29th, 2015, the Bass Pro Shops at the Pyramid officially opened to the public. The final product that the brand ended up building was pretty insane considering what it was housed in. The once hardwood floors of the basketball court had now been turned into an artificial swampland, fitted with fake cypress trees and a sprawling water feature with the dock and boats. Among the actual fishing you can do, a restaurant contained in its own building and even a bowling alley, there is everything else you might expect to find in a Bass Pro Shop. But, you can additionally practice your archery, shoot some guns, and walk through a museum about duck hunting. The weirdness doesn't stop there, however, as surrounding the entire shopping floor is a hotel. Yes, that's right. For around $200 a night, you can stay in the 103-room Big Cypress Lodge, which has most of the rooms looking down onto the shops below. From the top looking down, the shape of the former grandstands is still apparent as the concrete frames from those remain in place and were repurposed for the hotel. Speaking of the top, the apex of the pyramid had finally been developed into a restaurant and bar surrounded by an observation deck. Bass Pro Shops actually extended the glass from the top and added two overhanging glass bottom balconies to which offer great views of Memphis and the Mississippi River. To get up there, you take the longest freestanding elevator in the world, traveling up 28 floors directly up the middle of the structure. After just four months, over a million people had visited the shopping and entertainment complex. But that's what's key here, the entertainment and tourism draw the property has. Remember, when it was all first conceived, all of this was part of the plan. A must-go-to destination filled with unique experiences contained in an unorthodox structure. The stadium aspect was never meant to be the only draw. However, of course, that's what ended up happening, and on its own, the Memphis Pyramid never worked. The abandoned entertainment spaces remained untapped, and the pyramid never became the iconic tourist attraction that so many thought it would have become. At the end, and adjusted for inflation, over $130 million of city funds had been invested into the project, all for something that never really worked all that well. Nor did it achieve the whole point of building this weird structure. Not only that, but it was also taxpayer money that helped fund another brand new stadium just on the other side of the city, essentially sabotaging the Temple of Doom. Eventually, however, regardless of how strange it might be, the Bass Pro Shop inside the pyramid actually fulfilled what it was supposed to do with building out those unfinished areas and actually making visitors to the city curious on what on earth that enormous triangle is. I know it did for 
me, and as someone who really enjoys good theming and unique structures, I really liked it. And I think it has a long and prosperous future ahead of it. But the bizarre history of this strange pyramid will always be intriguing to me, and how it ultimately led to an outdoors retailer taking up perhaps the least American outdoorsy icon you can possibly imagine. With every topic I cover on this channel, there is always so much more to talk about and explore. As of recently, I've become more active on our subreddit, r slash films. Another, less talked about branch of the community is our Discord server, one which I'll be spending a lot more time on, and one you can join today via the link in the description below. Both of these platforms are fantastic ways to discuss and share interesting information with me and the community. Of course, if you want to support the channel even further, Patreon has always been a great place for you to do that and get rewards. Thanks for the continued support, and there is a lot on the way, including Close for Storm. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching. Back in Tupelo in 1935